OK, welcome back. Today we're going to start one of two lectures on domain decomposition. This is a very large topic, um, very important topic for parallel computing as well. And today we'll talk about non-overlapping domain decomposition. And tomorrow we'll talk about overlapping domain decomposition. And a reference for today's lecture is this book by Toselli and Vidland. I think it is a very clear book. I'm going to go through basically parts of, first part of the first chapter. Um, and I'm going to follow their notation. I don't really like their notation because it seems a little bit um, unnecessarily complex. But I have a bad experience with inventing my own notation because then when I go back and forth, for instance, if you're going to go look at their book and then I have a different notation, then things get very complicated. So you'll have to bear with me a little bit because the notation will maybe be a little bit heavy. Um, but I think that that is probably the best choice. Okay, so the overall, overall idea of domain decomposition is that we may have a partial differential equation defined on some kind of domain and we're going to try to split the domain into parts. And in non-overlapping domain decomposition, the, um, the parts are obviously non-overlapping. Okay, so let's solve for a differential equation. And let's just use this simple elliptic problem. Okay, and it's a boundary value problem, so we're going to say that that uh, we want to find u in omega, which is the domain, and u equals 0 on the boundary of the domain. OK, and today's lecture, we're only going to talk about two domains. But the more interesting case is multiple domains, and that's where a lot of parallelism comes in. Okay, so let's suppose that we have some kind of domain that looks like this. We're going to split up the problem into two domains. Let's call one domain omega 1, another domain is omega 2. Okay, this circular boundary is denoted like this. Okay, and this interface between the two domains we're going to de donate as gamma. Okay, so this is gamma. Now the domain omega 1 and omega 2, they do not include the interface or the boundaries. Okay, so that, to be precise, let me maybe say that do not include the interface or boundaries. All right. So my approach, and I think the approach that these authors use and also um, many authors in domain decomposition, is to try to draw a connection between the differential problem and the algebraic problem. And I think that that is an effective way of understanding how these methods work and what these methods can do, as opposed to just concentrating on the linear algebraic problem. And this, I think, will be particularly important in our next lecture on, on overlapping domain decomposition. So under suitable conditions, this boundary value problem is equivalent to another problem which I'm going to write down right now. So under suitable conditions, the boundary value problem is equivalent to I'm going to solve, I'm going to define a u1 
So ui is going to be the solution on the ith subdomain. Okay, so I'm going to say, say uh, this problem on omega 1, okay, and u1 is equal to 0 Dirichlet boundary condition on the boundary of omega 1, but not including the interface. Okay, so that I'm going to denote like this with a backslash gamma, so not including the interface. And u1 is equal to, I'm going to write u2, which is the solution on u2. So u1 and u2 are the same on the interface. Okay. So this is not quite enough because we have a second order differential equation. So we need a second condition on the interface. So this was, it will be a derivative will be a derivative condition. It will just say that the flux across the interface is the same on both sides. Okay? So I'm going to write that as di u1 by di n1 where n1 is the outward pointing normal for the first subdomain. And that's equal to minus di u2 di n2 and that's on the interface okay and then we have the problem on the second subdomain which I'm going to write as a plus in of u2 equals f on the second subdomain and u2 is equal to 0 on the boundary of the second subdomain except for the interface. Okay. So these two conditions over here on the bound on the interface are often called transmission conditions. Okay. And to be explicit, these two problems are equivalent. Okay? So we first had this nice problem, right? Defined using one subdomain. And now we have this more complicated looking problem, but it's defined on two adjacent subdomains, two touching subdomains. Okay, so these two under suitable conditions, they're equivalent. And we're going to try to look at, so we know, for instance, if we discretize this problem, how to solve this problem using linear algebra, we're going to see what is the linear algebra problem for solving this. Okay. So we could, for instance, take this linear algebra problem and say, well, what is domain decomposition on this linear algebra problem? So that would just be the pure algebraic approach. But I think it's useful to look at this differential problem and saying, well, what is the algebraic problem that arises from here? Okay. And we're going to see that it leads to um, an iteration on a matrix for the sure complement over the bound over the variables on the boundary. But that is to come later in this lecture. Okay. So I'm kind of writing this on the bottom board because I'm going to put this up and we're going to refer to it over and over again. So let's look at the discrete version of this problem, and we, there, will, will, there will be uh, some notation um, starting now. So let's call this the discrete or algebraic viewpoint. Okay, and for concreteness. Let's just look at a very simple one-dimensional problem. I really love one-dimensional problems, as you can tell. All right, so here is a, here's a one-dimensional problem. 
There are five unknowns, and there are, are additional uh, boundary variables over here. So this is the boundary. I'm going to label that as zero. This is one, two, three, four, five, six. So one and six are boundaries. And the first subdomain is this one. And the second subdomain is this one. Okay. The subdomain doesn't include the boundary, but it includes every, but includes all of the space up to, but not including that boundary point. Okay. And this is the interpretation, um, you know, from finite elements. Okay. Which, which you don't really need to understand right now, but you will see that um, sub matrix subassembly is is an important concept. Okay. So three is the interface point. Okay. I don't really want to call it a separator because we don't want to think about it as the from the linear algebra point of view. But we could reorder. We could write down the matrix and reorder like we did before, where this interface variable is ordered last. Okay. So let's write down that matrix. So here's some notation. So this is A I A one uh, um, A I I. So internal variables to subdomain one. Okay, and then the coupling between the internal and the boundary for subdomain one. Okay. Um, actually, that needs to be moved over a little bit. Let me write down A11 for sub. I, I'll say 1, 1, but I really mean internal, internal, so AII. Okay. So this is for subdomain 2. And now the couplings A1, gamma, 1, A. A1, gamma, 2. A gamma one one, a gamma one two, and then a gamma gamma. Okay, so this is the matrix, right? It looks a little bit like one level of nested dissection. Okay, it looks like this. Let's see if I have everything. So these are zeros over here because there's no coupling between the sub the two subdomains. And then the, so this is the A U equals F problem, algebraically. This is going to be called U internal subdomain 1, U internal subdomain 2, and then U on the boundary. And the right-hand side, F, F internal subdomain 1, F internal subdomain 2, and F on the boundary. And if we look at this, this particular problem, again, to be very clear, U1, sorry, U internal for the first subdomain is 1 and 2. U internal for the second domain is 4 and 5. And U on the boundary is just 3. Okay, So for this example, this is a 5 by 5 matrix. So if the matrix is assembled in parallel, meaning we have a parallel computer and we're trying to solve this partial differential equation, each processor is going to assemble the part of the matrix corresponding to the partial differential equation. So it's not the case that the entire matrix is constructed and then distributed to the different parts of the, distributed to the, uh, let me say that again. It's not the case that the entire matrix is constructed on one processor and then distributed to the different processors. The individual processors construct their own subproblems. Okay? So I'm going to write down what each processor sees in this discrete algebraic view. <coughs> 
So if the matrix is assembled in parallel, okay, then we're going to have a a matrix called A for the first subdomain. That's a two by two block matrix. A internals, AI, gamma, A gamma, internal, A gamma, gamma. Okay, and this is all for the first, the ith subdomain. Okay, and similarly we're going to have a right hand side contribution for the ith subdomain, and that's F internal, F on the boundary for the ith subdomain. Okay, so how are these quantities related to these quantities? Okay, so this A gamma gamma, that's equal to A gamma gamma for the first subdomain plus A gamma gamma for the second subdomain. And similarly, F gamma is equal to F gamma for the first subdomain plus F gamma for the second subdomain. And let me show you what this looks like for this example. Okay, so for this example, we have A1. So it's a one-dimensional finite difference discretization center differences. 2 minus 1, minus 1, 2 minus 1, minus 1, 1. Okay. So that's not a 2 over there. And then, actually this is not A1, my notation, this is A2. And I'm going to permute this. I'm going to reverse the ordering for the second subdomain, and you'll see in a moment why. Okay. So this is a for the sub first subdomain and A for the second subdomain. So each processor assembles this small matrix. And when you put them together, when you add them together, you get the 5 by 5 matrix. You get this 5 by 5 matrix and you can see that this third variable, or third equation, overlaps. Okay, so this is where the 1 plus 1 gives us the 2 over here. Okay. So similarly, we can define, let me write it over here. So we've, we've defined quantities on each subdomain. We can also define a sure complement for each of these subdomains. So S superscript 1 would be the sure complement of this matrix. Um, let's say of this matrix. So let's call this superscript I. Okay. And that's just equal to A gamma gamma minus A gamma internal, A internal inverse, A internal gamma, all four subdomain I, okay? And the sure complement, which would be the sure complement now for this matrix, okay, that is equal to S1 plus S2 in the case of two subdomains. <coughs> 
All right, so all of this notation we will be using over and over again. So now I'm going to write down the algebraic version of this problem. Okay. So algebraic view of the equivalent problem, All right, this equivalent problem. All right. So this is where you can maybe start to work things out a little bit yourself. Okay, so, you, so here's the equivalent problem and here's the notation that we're going to try to use. Okay, and the equivalent problem looks like these first three equations, which is a Dirichlet boundary value problem, right? It has value 0 on one end, let's say this end, and a value that is set okay, on, on the interface, let's say over 3. So it's a Dirichlet boundary value problem. So we could try to write down what that problem is. And then the second one is going to have a Dirichlet condition on one side and a Neumann condition at the interface. Neumann condition meaning it's a condition on the derivative of the differential equation. So a, so it's kind of like a, a Dirichlet problem and a Neumann problem. Okay, so that is, that is how we're going to look at it first, although there are different ways of looking at it. For instance, Neumann, Neumann, Dirichlet, Dirichlet. We'll see, we may have time to see that in a moment. Okay, but if we assume that first, um, what is the way of algebraically writing down this first equation, right? So we have, so we could go back to this thing. We can say it's the first block row of this equation. That gives us the internal points, right? So let's write down the first block row of that. So A internal, A internal boundary all in the first subdomain, and the variables are u1 and u, u internal and u1 all on the first boundary condition, all on the first subdomain equals f on the first subdomain. Okay, so that's just writing down the first block equation over here. And this gives us an equation for the internal variables, in this example, 1 and 2. And then we need to set the Dirichlet condition on the interface. And we can write that as u gamma, the value on the interface, is equal to u gamma for, on the interface for the second subdomain. And we're just going to call that u gamma. Okay, so this corresponds to this Dirichlet problem. And how about the Neumann problem? Well, for the Neumann problem, again, we can write down an equation for the internal variables. Okay, so that's going to look like this, except all for the second subdomain, A internal a internal gamma second subdomain, u internal u gamma second subdomain equals f 
internal second subdomain. And then we need Okay, so this in, so this also includes the Dirichlet condition on one of the ends. We have okay, so uh, we're, we're assuming that we've eliminated that boundary condition and it's incorporated into the right-hand side. So now we're left with how do we interpret this? Okay. So we can look at. We can interpret um, the flux as a type of residual. Okay, so we're going to balance the fluxes on both sides. And that's writing down the equation for the third block equation, which we haven't used yet, for each of the local problems. Okay, and I'm going to balance them. So here's the third block equation. A gamma 1, A gamma gamma, U1, U gamma, all for the first subdomain. Okay, I'm, I'm going to subtract F gamma of the first subdomain. And that's going to be equal to the same thing for the second subdomain, but with a minus sign, right? So f with this minus sign over here, which you may or may not be able to see. So A gamma internal, A gamma gamma, all for the second subdomain, U internal, U gamma, second subdomain, minus F gamma, second subdomain. Okay? And I'm and there's a minus sign for in the second part. All right. So these two equations now these two equations now not these two. These two equations this is like a Neumann problem, and these two equations is like a Dirichlet problem. Okay? All right, so now we're done with all of the notation. This can go up. Okay, now we're going to talk about the first method, and if we have time, we'll talk about a second method. The first method we're going to talk about is called the Dirichlet-Neumann algorithm. Okay, and it's exactly um, what we've written down here. Um, using this notation, okay? And the idea of the Dirichlet-Neumann algorithm is that we're going to solve iteratively, okay? In each iteration, we're going to first solve the Dirichlet problem on the first subdomain, okay? That will tell us something about the solution on the first subdomain. And then within this, the second half of the iteration, we're going to solve a Neumann problem on the second subdomain Neumann problem meaning we will have a derivative condition on the interface and we will know what that derivative condition is based on the solution of the first subdomain. Okay? And then we're going to, so that's one iteration and we're going to repeat that iteration until we converge. Okay, so that's called the Dirichlet-Neumann algorithm and we're going to see how that's related to the Schur complement later on. Okay, so the idea is to solve iteratively and then in each iteration we're going to solve a Dirichlet problem 
one first subdomain. And then solve Neumann problem on the second subdomain. And we're going to keep iterating like that. Okay. Let me write the algorithm over here. Okay, so we need to start with an initial guess for the value that's on the boundary. Okay, start with a guess for the value on the boundary. I'm going to call that u. gamma I'm going to okay, I'm going to call that u gamma with a superscript 0 So there's going to be some additional notational difficulties in a moment. I was just seeing if I can delay that a little bit. Okay, so now I have a superscript zero without the brackets, which is an iteration counter. Okay, it's an iteration index. Okay, and by the way, in order to make sure you're not confused, you know, I'm using Fs on, on both the differential and discrete sides. Okay, and hopefully that won't be a source of confusion either. Okay, so I'm using some of the same types of uh, notation, like U is both used on both the discrete and the uh, discrete and the differential sides. Okay. So this is, so now we're going to talk about um, what I'm going to write down is the, the algorithm from the differential point of view, from the, from the differential equation point of view. So this is a, this is a continuous function, not a discrete solution, not a discrete function. So So this is going to be the PDE view. So I'm going to start with some, some guess, and we're going to loop. It's a little bit weird to think about an algorithm applied to a continuous problem, but this is how some of our great uh, scientists in the past have thought about this. For instance, Schwartz in the uh, overlapping case, which we'll see tomorrow. So we're going to have a loop from n equals 0 to 1 to 2, et cetera. Okay, and in the beginning of the loop, we're going to solve this problem. Okay, so I'm just going to basically write that down. Okay. And I'm going to use a superscript in red to it indicate the iteration count. Okay, so this is going to be a solution for the first half step. So I'm going to write n plus a half. Okay, so at the very first iteration, n is equal to zero, so this is u at the first half step. Okay, so I'm going to solve all of these things at the first half step. Um, this I know is a little bit small, but there, I should have left myself more space, but these are all n plus a half. Except for this one, which is n. And at the very first iteration, n is equal to zero. So this is why we needed this initial guess. So we had some initial guess for the value on the boundary sorry, the, for the value on the interface, and therefore we have this well-defined Dirichlet boundary condition, Dirichlet boundary value problem to solve. Okay? 
All right, and in the second half of the iteration, we're going to solve the second, the Neumann problem. So I'm just going to copy that down first. U2, I'm going to leave some extra space for my iteration counter, equals F in the second subdomain. U2 is equal to 0 on the boundary, not including the interface of the second subdomain. And the derivative condition di u2 by di n1 equals minus di u1 by di n1 on the interface. Okay. So this is going to be iteration n plus 1. And this is going to be iteration n plus 1. And this is going to be iteration n plus 1. We're trying to find u2, right? But for the derivative on the involving the other subdomain, we don't have, you know, we're, we don't have uh, the solution at n plus 1, but we just computed it at n plus a half. Okay, so this is where the method is has this slightly explicit nature, right? So this is n plus a half. Okay. And finally, we need u on the boundary. And that's just going to be equal to u2. So u on the boundary at n plus 1 is going to be u2 at n plus 1. In other words, the solution at the n plus first step of the Neumann condition, the Neumann problem in the second subdomain. Okay, and then end loop. Okay, so this is the Dirichlet Neumann algorithm in the differential form. Okay. And now we're going to write it down in the algebraic viewpoint. All right, so here's the algebraic viewpoint. OK. I think I might need the whole length of it for the algebraic viewpoint. So let me, you don't need to do this in your notes, but I'm going to come back over here and write something. So I'm going to write the algebraic viewpoint. Okay. And I'm going to need some notation. And this is following uh, Toselli and Vidland. Okay, so, so we had u1, u internal on the first subdomain, u internal on the second subdomain. We're going to call these v1 and v2 uh, and w2. v1 and w2. And the reason that they introduce this notation is because we want to use superscripts for the iteration counter. And they already have superscripts over here, which starts to make things a little bit complicated. So you can see how this notation starts to get a little bit messy. So we're going to use this as well. Um, but we're going to get rid of v1 and w2 in a moment, as you will see. OK, so this is just some notation. So these are the internal variables in the first subdomain and internal variables in the second subdomain. OK? All right, so now we'll write the, the algebraic view. And again, And again, we'll start with a guess. U gamma 0. So this is now a discrete solution. And a loop n equals 0, 1, 2, etc., until we converge. And what do we write down? So we want to write down the algebraic view of this equivalent problem, which is up over here. 
and we're going to use the same types of iteration counters. In other words, how one iterate depends on the next iterate. All right, so, so that is the, the Dirichlet problem for the internal variables, A11, AII, AI, gamma, V1, U gamma. So these are for the first subdomain. So here I've used V1 for the first time. It's the internal variables of the first subdomain. So that's F1 in the first subdomain, F internal in the first subdomain. Okay, and then what am I going to write for this? This is going to be n plus a half. Right? And u gamma, that's just going to be n. Okay. <coughs> uh, is that right? Yeah, so that's actually just going to be n. I could be a little bit more specific and say u n plus n plus a half, and that's going to be equal to un, which would be the Dirichlet condition. Okay. In other words, if I wanted to write that down, do you want? Should I do that? Since I already did this, I kind of not feel like doing that. So this is combined those first two equations corresponding to the Dirichlet problem. Okay. And you can see that this is known, right? So we could move it to the right hand side. So it's just a equation of this, this many equations for this many variables. So that's well-defined linear system to solve. And now for the second half of the iteration, we need the Dirichlet condition, sorry, the Neumann problem to solve. And I'm just going to write down that Neumann problem. So A I I A internal boundary all in the second subdomain multiplied by the variables in the sec second subdomain. So here I'm going to use W2 for the first time. And again, U on the interface equals F internal for the second subdomain. Okay, so this is this is this equation over here. Okay, and we have the flux condition over here as well, right? And I'm going to just copy that over here. So you'll just have to believe me that I'm going to copy it correctly because I'm going to have to hide that. Okay, so that's A internal A gamma gamma V1 U gamma minus F gamma equals minus A gamma 1 A gamma gamma W2 U gamma minus FR F gamma, sorry, for the second subdomain. Okay, so the first ones are for the first subdomain. So for the second subdomain. Okay. So these two equations are for the Dirichlet pro for the Neumann problem. And how should we write in the iteration counters? So this W is this solution over here. So we'll write n plus 1. So this is the same W, n plus 1. The solution on the boundary for the Dirichlet problem, 
in the current iteration, n plus 1. v1, the internal values on the first subdomain. We just computed them over here, right? So, and we're going to use them. So this is a known value, n plus a half. And this one, this one is a little bit tricky. Okay, so it's really the flux that's evaluated at this previous, um, the flux evaluated for the other subdomain, for subdomain one. Okay. And we want to keep it the same as the solution that we found in subdomain 1. Okay. So this is going to be n, same as this. So th these two variables, these two vectors are the same up over here, and these two vectors are the same down over here. Just like over here, we needed to compute the solution on the boundary. The solution on the boundary is just this thing over here. So I'm not going to write it explicitly. So this ends the loop. Where this is the n part, and this is the d part. I can write these two equations a little bit more easily, a little bit more simply, because the vector, this vector is the same as that vector. So I'm just going to write it as a matrix equation. Note that n can be written as So A internal, A internal boundary, A boundary internal, A boundary boundary, all for the second subdomain. Okay, so I've, I'm taking these two things, putting them together. And then the variable W2, U gamma. And then on the right-hand side, F1, F internal for the second subdomain. And then this one, F on the boundary for the second subdomain, minus a whole bunch of junk. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna call that lambda gamma. It's not really junk, but I'm gonna call it lambda gamma. And then, to finish it off, we could put in the iteration counters n plus 1 for the w2 and n plus 1 for the u on the interface. Right. Let's write down what for completeness, we write down what lambda gamma is. That's just the flux on the other subdomain. That's this top thing over here. I'll just copy that down. A gamma internal, A gamma gamma, first subdomain, V1, U gamma, minus F gamma, first subdomain. And we can also use a, so these have counters on them. So this is n plus a half. This is n. And because this has counters, we typically will put a counter on the lambda as well. So we'll call this n plus a half. And I'm going to label this as equation 2. 
And I'm going to label this as equation 3. There was an equation 1, but I pointed to it rather than, than referred to it later. So we won't need equation 1. OK. So this method is implementable. You could implement this and try it out. Okay. Now what I want to show you to try to draw some connections to maybe some methods that you may have seen before, how the Dirichlet-Neumann algorithm is related to a preconditioned iteration involving the Schur complement. Okay, so the Schur complement was defined up over here, in case you don't know that. Okay. relation to a preconditioned iteration with the sure complement OK, so the Schur complement is a system that in the Schur complement system involves only variables on the interface, only the gamma variables. So we're going to have to get rid of, by elimination, the variables, the internal variables v1 and w2. OK? So there we have an equation for v1. So we can write down explicitly what it is. So I'm just going to take this equation and I'm going to, I'm going to, um, and since I want to eliminate it, I'm going to write down explicitly the formula for it. So V1 and let me put also the N plus a half here. So V1 is a internal first subdomain inverse times F internal first subdomain minus A internal gamma first subdomain UR, U gamma, and that's at the end step. Okay, so that's just taking this thing and writing out explicitly the formula for B1. And I'm going to substitute this into 2. Okay. Um, is it 2 or 3? Substitute into 3. Okay, I'm going to substitute this into 3 so that I can get rid of the V1s. And I'm going to move over to the left side of the board. So 3 has this formula lambda gamma it has a n plus a half so there's a a gamma 1 gamma internal first subdomain okay so that's multiplied by v1 i'm going to write down v1 that's A internal first subdomain inverse F1, F internal first subdomain minus A internal gamma first subdomain U gamma, this is at step N. 
Okay, and then we have this second thing that's multiplied the A gamma gamma first subdomain u gamma at the nth step minus fr, f gamma, first subdomain. Okay, so I basically just copied this down and I substituted v1 into there. Okay, and you'll see that if we factor out a u gamma, there's going to be a a gamma gamma minus a gamma internal inverse of that guy times a internal gamma. That's just the sure complement on the first subdomain, which was defined up over here, but it's actually covered. Okay, so that's just the sure complement on the first subdomain that multiplies u gamma at step n plus some leftover stuff, a gamma 1, gamma internal, gamma internal, first subdomain, a internal inter on the first subdomain, inverse, f internal on the first subdomain, minus f on the boundary of the first subdomain. And this extra stuff I'm going to call minus g on the boundary. And that's for the first subdomain. And if I write it more cleanly, that's just lambda gamma at the n plus first at the n plus a half step sure complement on the first subdomain solution on the subdomain at the nth step minus g gamma on the first subdomain and let's call this equation 4 Okay, so we've eliminated V1. Now we're going to eliminate W2. This is just algebra. It's obviously not difficult. Um, but, but conceptually, you know, I said this earlier, but because it's uh, important. Conceptually, we want to find what the equations look like for just the interface variables. And that's why we're trying to get rid of V1 and W2. Okay. Okay, so the equation involving W2 is a little bit more complicated. That's uh, this thing. It's in a matrix. And instead of writing this huge big mess, I'm going to use a, use, uh, use a template. Use this template to tell me what the solution should look like. Okay, so this is like a bit of an aside. Suppose we have a block matrix B, F, E, C and we have this system xy equals fg, okay? So our system involving the w2 is this 2 by 2 block system, right? And we want to eliminate w2 and write down the equation for the variable on the interface, okay? So instead of writing all these superscripts and everything, what is the formula for y? That's basically what I want to say. What is the formula for y over here? Okay. So the formula for y looks like this. C minus E B inverse F times y equals G minus E B inverse F, lowercase f. And this thing over here is obviously the sure complement of that matrix. Maybe I shouldn't call it S because I've used S before. I'm just going to write sure complement. Okay. So now we'll try to write down what is uh, 
what is gamma u So therefore, eliminating W2 from equation 2, okay? So we're going to eliminate W2 from equation 2. So U gamma at the n plus first step. is equal to, okay, so it's not, so if we follow this pattern, it's the sure complement of this thing, and that's the sure complement on the second subdomain, right? So I'm going to write the sure complement on the second subdomain, okay? So I'm using this template, sure complement times the guy that we want to know equals G, which is the second thing. So that's F gamma second subdomain minus lambda gamma at step n plus a half. Minus E B inverse F. Minus, so E is this guy, A gamma internal second subdomain, B inverse, A internal, second subdomain, inverse, and then F, which is just F internal, second subdomain. Okay? Remember these blue? So earlier we defined this thing called G, which I think, did I just erase it? No, here, it's over here. So G for the first subdomain, G gamma on the first subdomain looks like this. And we have something that looks very similar over here for the second subdomain. So this, if you take a look at this, that's just G gamma on the second subdomain. So together, they're G gamma on the second subdomain. So we can rewrite this as S2 U gamma N plus 1 is equal to minus lambda gamma at the n plus a half step minus g gamma on the second subdomain. Okay. Now we're going to substitute this guy, the lambda. So now we're going to substitute equation 4 for lambda gamma. Okay. So on the left-hand side, we have S, sure complement on the second subdomain equals so this is sure complement on the first subdomain, u gamma at the nth step. Do I need a minus sign? Yeah? Minus sign plus g gamma on the first subdomain plus g gamma on the second subdomain, which I can just call 
G gamma, okay? And this you may recognize as a splitting method. Maybe if I clean it up a little bit, um, actually it doesn't really need to be cleaned up that much, except maybe put in directly G gamma over here, okay? So remember the Schur complement for the global system is equal to the Schur complement of the first subdomain plus the Schur complement of the second subdomain, right? So this is an iteration based on a splitting. of the sure complement. So I'll write down that iteration over here. So you know how in a splitting method um, we've assigned iteration counts to the same variable, but this equation satisfy the exact solution is satisfied if we equate these two things this at the at the two different iterations. So let me do that first. So s to u gamma. So that's let's say the exact solution on the interface equals s one u gamma plus G on the interface. Um, I need a minus sign. And I can rewrite that as sure complement on the first interface, on the first subdomain, sure complement on the second subdomain times U gamma equals G gamma. So this is the Schur complement. So we have an equation, the Schur complement times the solution on the interface is equal to some right-hand side, right? And this is the splitting. So normally we think of splitting as equal to m minus n. So in the iterative me methods literature, we often use m minus n to represent the splitting. So here the m is s2. That's because that's the thing that has the n minus 1, n plus 1. And this is minus n. And you could also write this iteration in another way. You could write u gamma at the n plus first step is equal to i minus the Schur complement on the second interface, second subdomain inverse times the Schur complement. So this is the i minus m inverse a form of the iteration. u gamma at the nth step plus S2 inverse GR, G gamma. Okay, so this is another way of viewing the same iteration, the same iteration over here. And the way that you would implement this, because we don't have the sure complement, so in the parallel computing setting, there is no global sure complement that is assembled. We only have S1 and S2, right? The first processor has S1 and the second processor has S2. So the way that this is implemented, this iteration, U gamma 
n plus 1 is equal to, this is the m n, m inverse n form of the iteration, s2 inverse s1 u gamma at the nth step plus s2 inverse g gamma. Okay, so now the iteration is only written in terms of sure complement on the first subdomain, sure complement on the second subdomain. It's an iterative method. At each iteration, we need to multiply by the sure complement on the first subdomain, which corresponds to solving the Dirichlet problem on the first subdomain, and then solving with the sure complement on the second subdomain, which corresponds to solving with the Neumann problem on the second subdomain. So let me give you a taste. So we're done with the um, Dirichlet-Neumann algorithm. Let me give you a taste of how these ideas are extended to other algorithms. So we won't go, go through it mathematically, but let me give you an idea of what this Neumann-Neumann algorithm looks like. Okay, so in the Neumann-Neumann algorithm, we take the equivalent problem, which is still here. Okay, we split it up in a, in a different way. It's not Dirichlet-Neumann. Okay, we're going to take this equi equivalent problem, and we're going to solve a Dirichlet problem on each of the subdomains. Then we're going to solve a Neumann problem on each of the subdomains. So that's one iteration. Okay. And the Dirichlet problems can be done in parallel. So let's write that down. So solve Dirichlet problems on each subdomain omega i in parallel. Then solve Neumann problems on each subdomain in parallel. So this means Dirichlet problems, meaning we have Dirichlet data on the interface. This means we have Neumann data on the interface. And again, if we work through all of the algebra, we're going to end up with an iteration involving the sure complement. Again, in the discrete algebraic view, have an iteration involving the sure complement S. And the iteration, again, is a splitting. But the m here is different from this, S2. So by the way, we're trying to solve this equation involving the sure complement as the matrix. And this is a, sometimes people call this a preconditioned iteration, a preconditioned Richardson iteration, where the preconditioner is the sure complement in the second part. So that might be a good approximation for the sure complement of the first thing maybe only differs by a constant, I mean by a factor, if S1 is very much the same as S, S2, okay? So here we're going to have another preconditioner. So M in this Neumann-Neumann problem is not S2. It's S1 inverse plus S2 inverse all inverse. It's a little bit of a weird. So this is the preconditioner. And this is implemented as an iteration on the interface Okay, so we're going to update the previous value on the interface plus 
the inverse of m, so that's just s1 inverse plus s2 inverse, times the residual, which is g on the interface minus the sure complement times the solution on an interface at the nth step. So this is just the residual. Okay. But in general, if you talk about the Neumann-Neumann algorithm, people will just say it's a preconditioner, and this is the preconditioner, and, and you can use the preconditioner for a crowd subspace method as opposed to using it within this Richardson iteration. Similarly for the Dirichlet-Neumann algorithm. Okay, so let me end up by giving you an exercise. It's a fairly simple exercise, I think, but it will force you to think about a few things. So here's an exercise. We want to solve AX, uh, let's call it AU equals F. All right, and we're just going to look at the algebraic point of view rather than also look at the differential point of view. So in other words, we're going to try to solve this linear set of equations, but we're not given the matrix A. So we're going to assume that we're given A on the first subdomain okay, and A on the second subdomain, and assume that there's two subdomains. And A on the first subdomain is of size n1 plus n gamma, where n1 is the number of internal variables and n gamma is the number of var variables on the interface. This has n2 plus n gamma. Similarly, we're going to be given f on the first subdomain and f on the second subdomain. So this is using the same notation as I'm using up over there. Okay. And f, you have to assemble these together. And assume that the interface variables are in the same order at the end. Okay, so that's an obvious assumption to make. You need to make this assumption in order to couple the first and second subdomains together. And then the task is very simple, which is to implement this iteration, the Dirichlet-Neumann iteration in MATLAB, to solve this equation. And you can choose your own test problem, but the algorithm should not be any different once you uh, specify these inputs. So implement the method star, which is this method over here. Okay? All right, so that was a lot of writing. My hand is very sore. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be here afterwards to answer them. Otherwise, I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.